Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's segment of Meditating on the Word of God. And as you know, we started a brand new series and are ending that series today. And that is SQ. How is your SQ? How's your spiritual quotient? We said at the beginning of the series, looking at five verses from the book of Ephesians, that we have verses that we found that mention the words in the heavenly realms. We said in the heavenly realms is where all our blessings Our spiritual blessings do not begin on earth or in the natural realms, but rather starts in the heavenly realms or in the spiritual realms. It is where all our strength and power reside because that is where Jesus is seated above the heavenly realms. Thirdly, it is where our manifold wisdom is, and it is also where our real struggles in life are. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 tells us, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces in the heavenly realms. And those are the demonic forces that we talked about last week, against the spiritual authorities and dark evil forces. Thus, we go back to Ephesians 1 verse 18, which says, I pray that the eyes of your heart, your spiritual eyes, may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which God has called you to. And not just that, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people that the enemy wants to steal from us. And as such, we talked about opening your eyes to the spiritual realm, and secondly, opening your eyes to the reality of a thief who's trying to steal from us. We looked at John chapter 10, verse 10, where it says, the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy, but Jesus have come or has come that he may may give us life and life to the full. The idea last week was to show you how he steals from us. He steals from us through temptation, through deception, through condemnation and accusation. But today, I want to deal with how does he kill and destroy you? I've entitled this message, Breaking from the Cage, Breaking Free from the Cage. The idea of breaking free is found in the first chapters of the book of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 2, it tells us how freedom or breaking free is necessary in order to escape death. The Lord commanded the man, you are free. This is the first time the word freedom or free is ever mentioned in the entire scripture. You're free to eat from any tree in the garden. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will certainly die. Then the devil can kill you, the devil can destroy you, once you lose this idea or this truth of freedom. First point, why is freedom, what's freedom got to do with? Why is it so important? Well, first of all, it's a command. If you revisit the verse in Genesis 2 verse 16, It is literally the very first commandment in the entire Bible. The Lord commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. Because God insists on freedom. Why does he insist on freedom? Because freedom is a daily decision. It is a daily declaration that says, God, I choose to obey you. I have a choice not to obey you. And thus I have the freedom to walk away but I decide to do it. And that's why he's commanding us. He wants us to understand this is something very important. To choose whether to follow him or not to follow him is because he's given us the free will to do so. Because it's about love. When you choose something because you don't have a choice or because someone's going to kill you out of fear, that is not love. Love is love when you have the freedom to choose and walk away from it. Thus, God wants you to be free to do so. Now, there's another thing to remember about freedom. It's not just a command. It's not just about love. It's actually powerful and dangerous. When it comes to mind, what comes to mind are the words of Peter Parker's uncle, when the Spider-Man, when he said, with great power comes great responsibility. Freedom is a great power to do the things you want to do and to make life the way it ought to be. But it's also very, very dangerous because you may choose to be irresponsible and make the wrong choices. You can either build a great life or you can destroy your life. Which brings me to the second point. How exactly does this thief steal your freedom? There's a variety of ways that we will see in a while, but I want you to understand if he can steal your freedom and he can steal your relationship with God, based on this freedom, he can now kill and destroy you. He can kill and destroy you in your spiritual life, in your relational life, in your physical life, and even in your financial life. So how does he steal exactly? Well, he perverts your freedom. We see this in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. The serpent, the devil, the tempter, 
was more crafty than any of the wild animals that the Lord God had made. And this crafty tempter was, we saw last week, the first attack in stealing from us his temptation. He's turning your own power of freedom against you. Thus, he's perverting the very freedom that God gave you. And what did he say? Did God really say you must not eat from the tree in the garden? He was questioning the nature and the character and the love of God. Basically, giving Adam and Eve the choice to decide whether to trust God or not to trust God. The woman said this to the serpent, we may eat from the trees in the garden, which is not exactly accurate. The Bible does not say that. The Bible says we're free to eat from any tree in the garden. Further, she says, but God did say, you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge in the, of the, in the middle of the garden, which is not what God said. What God said is don't eat from the knowledge of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And she added some things to it. You shouldn't touch it or you will die. And something very big is missing. You will certainly die. Now, notice in verse 4 that God says, you will certainly, the devil says, you will not certainly die. It's negating the very words of God. This is beyond temptation. This is deception. The second way he steals from us. And when we don't know the word of God, we can easily be deceived. And then here comes not just the deception, but the accusation against God. God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Essentially, he was accusing God that he was withholding something from Adam and Eve, which was not true. How does he steal your freedom? He perverts your freedom through temptation, through deception, and through accusation, so that you will surrender your freedom. And that's exactly what Adam and Eve did. They gave their freedom to the devil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it and thus losing her position of freedom by ceding her own freedom to the temptation, to the deception, to the accusation that led her to sin. The trap that takes us away from the very freedom that God gives us. Further, in the next verse it says, she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. And that's, we see how the process of demonic activity happens. This time it's no longer the devil tempting, but she's the one tempting. This is how we lose our freedom. If he perverts our freedom, so we will surrender our freedom to trap us so that he can kill and destroy us. When we sin against God, we begin to build a wall of unrighteousness. And when we begin to build a wall of unrighteousness because of sin, we see in verse 7, then the eyes of both of them were open and they realized they were naked. And when you have nakedness, what happens next is what that simply means is you have guilt. Unrighteousness will produce guilt. They realized they were naked and thus they felt guilty, ashamed, unlovable, worthless. And what happens when you have unrighteousness and guilt, you're building the walls of your cage. Now you're paralyzed. When you're guilty, you feel paralyzed, damaged, and worthless. Genesis chapter 3 verse 7 continues. The eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So what do they do? They sold fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. This is the third wall of your cage. Unrighteousness leads to guilt and an attempt to cover yourself up with your own self-righteousness. In other words, an attempt to do things on your own, which is still a separation from God. And thus, now you have a three-walled cage that's ready to trap you. Further, in verse 8, the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden at the cool of the day. Before I show you the fourth part of your wall, this is what it says. God was simply walking. And when they heard the sound of the Lord God, and by the way, it says in the cool of the day, because God wasn't angry. He's actually rather cool. Now here it says, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees in the garden. This is the fourth wall of your cage. It's called shame. And at this point, your cage is built. And guess who built it? You. And how did the devil do it? He couldn't push you. He couldn't kill you. He couldn't destroy you. By the way, if the devil could kill you and destroy you, he would have pushed you down the staircase yesterday or down the escalator. But the truth of the matter is he can't. The way he kills you, he does not have the power to do that. His power comes from temptation, deception, condemnation, and accusation. And as you fall for these things, you're actually building the cage that will kill you. Unrighteousness, guilt, self-righteousness, and shame. Now, once happens, that happens, 
we find in verse 9, but the Lord God still called to the man. God is calling out to the man and says, where are you? And basically, obviously, we know that God knows where he is, but God was asking the same question to give him the freedom to respond in truth. And instead of responding in truth, that he was now stuck in his own cage, he answered, I heard you in the garden, and thus I was afraid because I was naked, and so I hid. These are the three things that will happen when you build that cage. Afraid, you're going to have fear. Because I was naked, you're going to have insecurity, and so you will hide, you're going to have isolation. This is exactly where the devil wants you to be. And at this point, you'll have fear, you'll have insecurity, you're going to have isolation. It is a shoe in for him to tempt you, to deceive you, to condemn you because you're separated from God and to accuse you and make you accuse others. Now, and at that point, he can steal your spiritual life, your relational life, your physical life, and even your financial life. Further in chapter 3, verse 11, and he, and, and he said, here's what he told God, uh, or rather what here God asked him. Notice God's still asking questions. Freedom to choose. Who told you you were naked? Instead of answering, and, and he, so God asked him the important question. Have you actually eaten from the tree I commanded you not to eat from? And here's the crux of the matter. Will you accept and admit to the fact that you made the wrong choice? Instead of admitting and saying sorry and repenting to God, the man said, the woman that you put here with me, she gave me some of the fruit and I ate it. Now notice, this is a statement of accusation. When you fall for the trap of the devil, you imbibe the spirit of the devil. She's now accusing his partner, his wife. Moreover, he's accusing God himself, the woman that you <laughs> put here. That's what happens when you fall for the cage of condemnation. That's what happens when you allow temptation, deception, condemnation, and accusation to brew around you. The next thing you know, you're trapped. The Lord God then turned to the woman and asked her the same question. Notice the idea of asking questions. What is this that you've done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. It's true that the serpent deceived her, but it's not true that that's why she ate. The truth is actually found in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and desirable for gaining wisdom, that's why she ate it. The point was the devil got her in the cage and because she can, she can now destroy her. And both of them are now totally deceived and are even lying not to the devil, but to themselves. How does he steal your freedom? He perverts your freedom. So you will surrender your freedom to trap, to kill, and to destroy you. Which brings us to our final point. How can you regain your freedom? Well, simply put, acknowledge and confess your sins. First John chapter 1, verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. It breaks the walls of unrighteousness. When we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and forgiving. And He will forgive all our sins and more importantly, purify us from all unrighteousness. Acknowledge and confess your sins. Secondly, appropriate Christ's work over you. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says, God made him, speaking of Jesus, who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the very righteousness of God. Again, by appropriating who Jesus is in our lives, the breastplate of righteousness, the very walls of unrighteousness crumble before us. We are become able to be set free. Romans chapter 8, verse 1, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has what? Set you free from the law of sin and death. Basically, what happens is when we confess our sins, when we appropriate who Jesus is, the walls of unrighteousness crumble before us. When we confess our sins and acknowledge what Jesus has done for us, the walls of guilt crumble before us. Thus, there is no need to be self-righteous and there is no shame at all. Our fear, our insecurity, our isolation become freedom. We become free to love God for who He is. How can you regain your freedom? Acknowledge and confess your sins. Appropriate Christ's work over you. Receive the freedom you have in Jesus. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1 says, It is for freedom 
that Christ has set us free. <laughs> it is for freedom. And that's why we can fight the devil, resist him as we submit to Jesus. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of a trap of slavery. Instead, be free in Jesus. Let me summarize this message for you. What's freedom got to do with it? It's a command. It's about love. It's powerful and dangerous. And you need to understand that. Secondly, how does he steal for your freedom? He perverts your freedom. So you will surrender your freedom to trap and kill and destroy you. How do you regain your freedom? Acknowledge and confess your sins. Appropriate Christ's work over you. Receive the freedom you have in Jesus. Let me remind you to download the SQ app that will help you fight the devil by praying, meditating, proclaiming, and fellowshipping. Download it, scan this QR code so you can get into the app and live it out the whole week. Have church Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and see you again next Sunday. Let me just help you pray and proclaim this message of Jesus this morning, today. Jesus, thank you for your holy word. We bless you, God, and we thank you for saving us and causing us to be righteous in the eyes of our Father God. In your name we pray, and everyone said, Amen.